All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I tend to like to say good morning. Uh, so good morning. Good morning. All right, I like that. Uh, how's everybody doing today? Okay, all right. A little bit, a little bit less, uh, less gusto than the good morning. Uh, well, hello, my name is uh, Kyle Shaver. Uh, I work in IT here at CISA. It's great to see you all here. Thank you so much for coming for the kickoff for Cloud Jam 2020. Uh, real quick, we'll go over the agenda for today. So uh, we're going to do a little bit of an introduction, kind of what the competition is, where it comes from. Uh, and then we have a guest speaker. We have Keith Roberts here from the Valley High. Uh, we'll give a presentation. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the cloud. And then we'll talk about the competition details. And then there will be a little bit of time to kind of uh, co-mingle, form teams, talk about ideas. Uh, we do have AWS Remote. Uh, and we have somebody from IBM here, uh, AWS being remote because of the coronavirus or uh, COVID. So uh, just out of an abundance of caution, they're gonna be uh, attending from Seattle. So thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, yeah, but then there's gonna be plenty of time for you to, again, talk amongst yourself, form teams, share ideas. So again, welcome to Cloud Jam 2020. This is the kickoff. Uh, this is a month long competition that will culminate in a showcase that will take place on April 6th at the same time in the same place. Uh, so a little bit about it, this is our sixth year uh, doing one of the Jam competitions. We started out with uh, App Jam, Virtual Augmented Reality Jam, and AI Jam. Has anybody here uh, participated in a Jam before? All right, not too many, that's great. So we're gonna have a lot of fresh faces here, that's awesome. Um, so this competition is put on by uh, us in IT, as well as some of our wonderful uh, partners, the CSUN Institute for Sustainability, CSUN i Toolbox LA, The Valley Hive, uh, IBM, and AWS. And so we wanted to make sure when planning this competition that we kind of took it back to why would you really have a competition? What kind of technology would we, would we ask students to work with, would students want to work with? Uh, and so we had a few kind of guiding principles. We wanted the competition and, the, and the, the technology request to be open to everyone. We wanted it to be fun. We wanted it to be relevant to our lives. We wanted it to be dynamic, and we wanted it to be meaningful. So we want all of these things to be a part of the Cloud Jam experience, of the competition experience. Um, and so I'll tell you a story that definitely didn't happen. We were walking, the, the whole entire team walking in front of the OVL library, and we were thinking about every single one of these, these principles and how we can kind of connect that back to students and back to the kind of spirit of the competition. And we looked up, and that's when it came to us. The cloud was the right way to go. It encompassed everything that we had in any of the previous competitions, while still being open and available and potentially um, you know, meaningful with the right challenge. Uh, and also, because there's so much to do in the cloud, it could be a lot of fun. So we decided, in order to keep the sky blue, in order to keep uh, those clouds looking gorgeous in the air, you really have to have uh, a clean environment. You have to have an environment with uh, with good air quality, which Los Angeles isn't quite as well known for. Uh, but sustainability is an important piece of that, the ability to not only keep the environment clean, but also to, to pass it down to future generations. So we focused on use cloud technology to address a sustainability issue, which we felt was pretty relevant to the city of Los Angeles, right? There are three pillars to sustainability, people, planet, profit, uh, there will also sometimes be uh, social, environmental, economic. Uh, you need each of these three components to have a truly sustainable initiative. Uh, it needs to be something that people are willing to do, something that people are willing to continue doing. It needs to be something that is uh, at least uh, continuous, uh, able to be continuously um, extracted via our natural resources. So the planet, you need to, to consider not only your inputs, but also your outputs. And then profit. If it's something that costs way too much money, it's not going to be sustainable because you're not going to be able to do it for very long before, uh, before you're going to have to stop. So these three pillars uh, are, are kind of perfect in Los Angeles. 
Uh, Los Angeles County was the largest economy by output in the United States, um, which accounts, uh, and our GDP accounts for 3.8% of the total US economy. So we definitely have the economic aspect of it. The social aspect, I mean, you can walk down pretty much anywhere uh, in Los Angeles and find somebody who wants to convince you of some of their causes or, or get you on board um, with, with their environmental or their social causes. Uh, but taking a look at this picture, uh, on the right-hand side over here, we see something that a lot of us in Los Angeles are pretty familiar with, uh, smog, right? Um, this is an actual photo of Los Angeles from the 1950s, uh, where there is a gentleman wearing a gas mask on Broadway because the smog is so bad uh, that they actually need to protect themselves from the poor quality air. Uh, over the past few years, the CO or the uh, ozone levels in Los Angeles have been slowly on the rise. We were doing really great uh, up until about 2007, and that's when we started to notice a bit of a small uptick again. And as you, know, as you can see, we're noticeably higher uh, than a lot of other major cities in the United States. And then the number of clean air days or bad air days that we had, so in this case, this is bad air days, uh, you can see we've We've reduced the number of bad air days here in Los Angeles, but we kind of plateaued, sort of been staying at the same number of bad air days every year. So definitely a huge opportunity for Los Angeles. So again, the team and I were walking down in front of the Oviat, thinking about these same principles. We look up, we see the cloud, we want the sky to be blue, we want the clouds to still stay there. So we decided we're gonna make a slight change to this. And we're gonna put a special emphasis on addressing a sustainability issue in Los Angeles. Because uh, again, there's a huge, huge, huge need for more than just recycling, more than just, uh, more than just monitoring your emissions, more than just carpooling, it's more than that. Again, there's the social side of it, there's the economic side of it. And again, what a great place in the Los Angeles area to, uh, to address those. So uh, to talk a little bit about sustainability, we have Keith Roberts, the head beekeeper from the Valley Hive to give us a little bit of a presentation, talk a little bit about what they do and how they approach sustainability. All right, can everybody hear me? Hello everybody, yes. uh, thank you Kyle by the way. Um, Kyle is a great guy. When he um, called me a couple weeks ago and asked me to speak, um, I you know, was like, yeah, I'll gladly come to see Sun and I'll, I'll, give this, I'll talk about these. Okay, it's, it's, it's gonna be a cloud jam. Oh, okay. And so I began like researching, okay, how do the bees relate to the cloud? And I thought I had this perfect metaphor. I called him and I said, hey, so this is what I'm thinking. And there was silence. He very politely said, "How do you talk about the bees and sustainability?" Like I, you know, like I was talking about, I, you stay in your lane. Um, and so that's exactly what I'm going to do. Um, and so uh, we run the Valley Hive over in on, uh, in Chatsworth on Topanga. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is how important and how relevant beekeeping is, and almost nobody really understands it or realizes it, uh, but we're surrounded by um, the need for uh, keeping bees healthy all the time. So a little bit of history. Um, beekeeping goes back a long, long way. Uh, more than 10,000 years ago, uh, we were interested in bees. So if that's not the definition of sustainability, I don't know what is. Um, the ancient Egyptians were the first migratory beekeepers. What the heck does that mean? Migratory. They were the first ones to figure out that if they put bees on a boat on the Nile River, sent them downstream, crops along the shore grew. And they didn't understand how that happened. They thought that the bees were the liaisons between the mortal world and the gods, but it did, and it was magic. And so everybody has seen these type of hives before. Anyone seen a Robin Hood movie? This uh, scap hive here. This is uh, 12, 13, 14th century technology. Some even older, they found uh, straw and clay uh, hives 
um, in parts of uh, Israel. But uh, this was beekeeping for a very long time, where you have the colony that would build inside of here, and then to harvest honey, what do you have to do? You gotta cut into it. You gotta almost destroy the colony. It was almost a certain thing. But this was what beekeeping technology was for a very long time. And it was important because it, to get the best to get light, you need a beeswax, longest burning wax. As a matter of fact, to this day, to be used in the Catholic Church, a candle must at least be 51% beeswax. Naturally, it's uh, soot free, clean burning, you add honey. That, of course, led to the world's first alcoholic drink. Um, and that really was appreciated. Uh, so uh, all of this stuff was really, really needed. And, but here we have a, a type of technology that really wasn't good for the bees. And the beekeeper was forced to like, well, I'm going to destroy these colonies here and let those ones survive the winter time and maybe I can build it up and do it again the next season. So this is a skip hive that's full of bees. And we also have top bar hives. So, uh, so these hives, basically it's an empty log. And you've got bars that are going across, and then from there, the bees actually build comb down below, and uh, you take the comb and you harvest it, you crush and strain it. Um, and this is an apiary with top bar hives. And uh, Napoleon loved bees. Uh, beekeeping is, of course, like I said, it was this worldwide phenomenon. You had the Vikings that, uh, like the Vikings and the Chinese invented meat around the same time. Some 4,500 years ago, you had um, beekeepers in India and in France, you had Napoleon that wanted his empire to emulate the honey. He wanted his, his, his empire to be industrious, to be loyal, to be hardworking. And uh, so uh, who here was raised in the San Fernando Valley? Raise your hand if you guys are, all right. So come on here, you guys, all right. So here we are, uh, SMW Easley. Uh, this is 1884. And uh, he's got more than 500 hives. Can anybody guess where this picture was taken? Any guesses? This is off Chapel Canyon, Scene Valley. Off what is now the 118. Mm -hmm. You go to Strathern Park over in Simi Valley, you can actually look at some of these letters that he was writing, these telegrams, when he's trying to coordinate how to get thousands of pounds of honey from horseback carriages to the docks in Long Beach. Really interesting stuff. Uh, the point being, in this area, uh, beekeeping has a very, very long history. <laughs> it's been integral. Uh, I know that some of you have heard of Los Angeles uh, making legal urban beekeeping. And it was this big deal. But it's kind of ironic because I belong to a bee association, the Los Angeles County Beekeeping Association, that goes back to 1873. Uh, so it really is a big part of our history. And uh, here's a few pictures. We have an extractor here, an old extractor. And uh, some more beekeepers that were in this area. And uh, so you're seeing now working in the field where we have these bars here, the beginnings of the Langstroth hive, which is what this is right here. and. Over in the, about the 1850s, Lorenzo Langstroth invented this hive. And it was based on the principle of bee space. But you guys didn't know that honeybees were, up, were as obsessive compulsive as many of us. And he found that bees will always build comb within 3 eighths of an inch of another comb. So it doesn't matter if the bees were in a skep hive or they were inside of a wall, or they're in a roof, or they're in any kind of cavity, they're always going to build comb between a quarter of an inch and three eighths of an inch. And that is called bee space. So he invented these, uh, the system that kept the frames separated with these end bars, and you're able to finally take out a frame of bees and not hurt them in the process, and be able to inspect them, and also to help save the precious wax so it that doesn't have to be destroyed. Can anybody guess how many flowers goes into this single pound of honey? What do you think? Can I have a number, sir? 
Two. We have two flowers for this pound of honey. Do, do, do I have a raise? <laughs> what do you mean? I have a thousand, we have five thousand, seven thousand times, seven thousand, we have a ten, ten, twenty, twenty. Two million flowers, ladies and gentlemen. Two million flowers for this single pound of honey. And it takes the energy equivalent of nine pounds of honey to build a single pound of wax. This technology changed everything. But here's the crazy thing about it, and this is where we need you. This is 1850 technology. We're using it today. Hasn't changed. This is still the technology that we're using. Millions of hives are right now in the almonds. Biggest uh, migration of bees in the world. Um, and uh, they're all in boxes like these. There's got to be something better. Get to it now. Um, so, <laughs> and so, uh, and so, like I said, these these are these are pictures from the 1800s and. There you are. And uh, boy, yeah, this is, I like this guy. Not even, not, not no vehicle, just wheelbarrows. Oh, by the way, <clears throat> this deep box, when it filled up, weighs 80 pounds. This medium box filled up. It's a medium box, weighs 40 pounds. This is their honey. This is theirs. Everything above that is honey for us. Okay? So that'd be another 40 pounds. So, do you, do you know what all this means? It means when I get asked by a customer if we should put a hive on the roof, the answer is no. Um, and so, another 1878 uh, picture. This is going to be over there in the San Gabriel Mountains. And uh, this is a great image of a wall where you have bees coming and going through one side and you're able to harvest honey from the other. So beekeeping sustainability. So as, I, as you saw, beekeeping goes back a very, very long way. Um, and it's still relevant today. Beekeeping is responsible for 30% of our food supply. Every third bite of food that you put in your mouth is because of the bees. You're welcome. Um, and so we're gonna discuss the three pillars, the social, economic, and environmental uh, components of beekeeping. So we'll start with the social. So we're going to talk about the bees a little bit. So this is a typical hive will build up between 60 to 80,000 bees inside of a colony. Uh, they communicate through scent and dance. Fun fact, you can smell a ticked off hive 20 feet away. It smells like bananas. Every time I go to the grocery store, the hair stands on the back of my neck, and that is why we use a smoker. Uh, bees will travel three to five miles to collect food. They can fly up to 15 miles an hour. They're the only insect that makes food that humans consume. And so this is an example of a brood frame. So a queen lays an egg. After 19 days, it gets a capping. And then on the 21st day, a baby bee will hatch. Remember one of those cappings? Oh, fun fact. Guess who does all the major work in the colony? The ones that make the honey, the ones that make the wax, the ones that actually defend the hive. Are they male or female? They're female, damn right. They're female, the boys don't do a darn thing. They do not cook, they do not clean, they can't even feed themselves, they don't even have stingers. Their only job is to mate with virgin queens. And they have to achieve that by October to get their wings chewed off and they get kicked out the hive because their sisters don't want to take care of their sorry ass in the winter time. So it is a female-led democracy. <laughs> And so here we have the three bees here. We got the drones, we got the queen, and we got the worker. So here is the queen. Now, for centuries before we pulled our collective head out of our collective behinds, uh, we thought that it was a king bee because, of course, you know, couldn't possibly be responsible for it. And we finally grew a brain and we realized, no, they're female. And she is the queen. She is the mother of every bee inside of that hive. She lays about 2,000 eggs a day. What have you done? Um, and so uh, she lives about two to four years. She mates with about 19 drones on average. She'll go on one mating flight and she'll use that material for the rest of her life. Uh, she has several pheromones that she's responsible for that the bees spread throughout the hive. And so the bees up top here, they know from the pheromone that mom down below here is doing just fine. 
Now we got the workers. Now these are the bees that make it all happen. They have wax glands. They're able to build wax. They're able to forage for nectar, pollen, and propolis. They defend the hive. They clean the hive. They take care of the developing bees. They take care of the queen. They make all the decisions for the hive. They do all the work. If I'm able to get you guys to leap at something here, I want you guys to start looking at bees the very same way that you look at individual cells of your body, right? A skin cell, an eye cell, hair cell, right? The individual cell doesn't define you, it's the trillions of cells that work in synergy to bring you, you, to make you who you are. That is what the bee is to the colony. It is the microorganism, this is the macroorganism, and every colony I work is slightly different. They have a slightly different personality. And so they make decisions based on consensus. It's one of the most purest forms of democracy on the planet. They make decisions as a whole as to when to defend the hive, when to swarm, when to abscond, abandon the hive, when to get the queen to lay more because we got food coming in. We need to take advantage of the nectar flow that's about to happen. Or winter's coming, we need to slow her down. The bees decide all this as a whole. Little tiny bees with little pin brains working together to make some really important decisions. Really quite amazing stuff. We got drones. These are drones. So, you guys are into uh, a little project. Um, they're not around yet. I haven't seen any bees with drones yet. It's going to happen soon. And uh, I know that it's warm out, but it's still technically winter. Um, but if you go to a park that have trees along the north side, you do this in April or uh, May. A nice clear day. Okay, I want you to take a rock and throw it in the sky as high as you can, and you just might see a couple drones chase after it like idiots because they think it's a virgin queen. Um, and that's why they have these really big eyes, so they're able to find that queen in flight. Um, they don't have uh, stingers, they hang out in drone congregation areas like I told you about, and they're found in the spring and summer, and by fall they get booted out the hive. Uh, so uh, another social aspect, going to the human side. Uh, humans love bees. Uh, there's a lot of associations that help them. We have the, uh, of course, there's us, we are educators. Uh, we sell honey, of course, but we also love teaching people about bees. Uh, we have the Los Angeles County Beekeepers, founded in 1873, and the California State Beekeepers, founded in 1889. Um, and so this is a typical meeting over in La Crescent. It's standing room only um, on a Monday night at 7 o'clock. People come from all over the Southland to go to these meetings. People care about bees. They really do. And um, it's a good thing because, as many of you have heard, they are in decline and it's been very difficult to manage them. Back in 1985, if you were an incompetent beekeeper, you might lose 10% of your colonies. Now you do everything right, your average loss is 40% if you're lucky. I want you guys to think of a business where you can lose 40% of your stock and still stay around. I don't think there is one. We're managing it, but it's very difficult and it's getting more challenging all the time. Uh, education. And so uh, at the Valley Hive, we uh, host a lot of different types of classes, uh, one of which is through the Los Angeles County Beekeepers Association. And we get more than 200 people coming through here and working bees. Um, and so, like I said, there is such a strong surge, especially here in Los Angeles, as Kyle was saying, and they were trying to find food in LA. We are going back to the time of wanting local food, wanting to have victory gardens, wanting to you know, know where our food comes from and having more of a connection with the environment and with nature, and bees are a natural part of that. <laughs> You know, even if you're not really into bees, you're just into gardening, and you, you just you, you love it. You've got the stone fruit, you've got your vegetable gardens, you've got your squash, you've got everything. Well, how do you make it better? Bees, bees make it better. And uh, so we're so we're seeing that there is a, such a strong demand 
um, from people who just love these beats. Uh, this is the bee booth at the LA County Fair where uh, thousands and thousands of people come on through and learn about the bees. Um, and it's been, it's not really a new thing of using bees to help people. Back in 1919, uh, the government was using beekeeping to treat PTSD from soldiers coming back from World War II. It was uh, very, very helpful to them, and you can see why. Because when you're holding a frame of stinging insects, you're not thinking about anything else. <laughs> you're thinking about the bees. And so it really helps actually to relax to really be in the moment, to be present. And I've seen this time and time again, everybody from grizzled veterans, yes, but also 10-year-old children who are afraid and they hold that frame and then it clicks. These are our friends, they're okay, they're good. And so we're trying to develop a program um, where I want, uh, we, 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 did a, we did a trial and it was really successful <laughs> But I want to teach veterans to train veterans. So um, if you have anybody that would be interested in that, please send them our way. Um, and so here's a program. Uh, Michigan State University is doing this, promoting veterans wellness and community development through beekeeping. This is precisely what they're doing. And I uh, saw their wonderful presentation in Chicago uh, last January. And uh, that was quite amazing. So now let's talk about the economic. Uh, side of things because a lot of people don't understand that you know this is if we were doing this some 10,000 years ago obviously um, you know there is a chance to make a buck or two right um, and so first we got pollination so farmers pay beekeepers to get hives on their land if you're an almond grower you can't even get crop insurance unless you can prove you have so many hives per acre. Without bees, it doesn't happen. And so depending on the crop, you get more or less. So with almond pollination, you're getting between 180 to $220 a hive this year. Uh, for blueberries, once again, around 200. Avocados, about 50. Cherries, about 100. And so I sat, for a little bit of scale, I sat next to an 86, oh by the way, what do you think the average age for a beekeeper is? What do you think? For a commercial beekeeper? What do you think? 40. 40. Anybody else? 20. 20. <laughs> 61. 61. I sat next to an 86-year-old gentleman from Idaho a few conventions back, and I said, sir, how many hives are you running? He said, oh, son, I'm down about hey, what I used to. So well, what's that? I'm down to 10,000 hives. <laughs> So you can go ahead and get your calculator out and do some quick calculations of what 200 times 10,000 is, and that was his payday for a single month. So there is a great demand for pollination. Um, so like I said before, they're responsible for 30% of our food supply. Mm -hmm. So we got almonds, apples, apricots, avocados, blueberries, cherries, it's a lot of happy things. So they are really important. Um, $18.9 billion industry, as a matter of fact. Um, and so um, there's this crazy thing that happens sometimes in Los Angeles. What is it? Uh, it comes out of the sky. It's wet. What, what is that? Rain. Oh, that's right. Rain. Okay, when it happens, it's a glorious thing. This is what it looks like in our apiary when it, when it doesn't rain, and this is what happens when it does. All right, because it takes how many flowers to make a pound of honey? Two million. So it's a lot of food that we need for the bees. So rain is so crucial, so crucial. And it's forcing us when we have these dry years that we have to consider moving our bees even as far as out of state just to get them food. Um, and so we really would like to have a little more rain. Uh, so this is, we are palletize our bees. And so we'll have four hives on a pallet. And this is us putting the bees on the rig. There's our, our, our truck named Chelsea. And uh, that's 120 hives on that truck. And uh, we move bees at night because we have no self-respect. We hate each other. No. Um, it's <laughs> when all the hoarders are back in the hive. And so once they come back, uh, that's when we can leave. And that's typically at night. And so a typical beekeeper will, will work from 6 o'clock to about 3 o'clock the next morning. 
Um, this is not me. This is what I hope to be someday. Uh, this is what 500 and some odd hives on the back of a big rig looks like. Uh, this is uh, the almond bloom. It's beautiful. Um, and this is us working bees. So uh, another thing that's happening is wildfires. And so forest beekeeping isn't hard enough. Now we're dodging wildfires. And uh, we, one of our colleagues out in Somis, on uh, the Thomas fire a couple years ago, the fire was coming over the berm, but it was going against the wind. So we had time when we rushed up there and moved the bees during the day. You can just guess how thrilled those bees were. Mm -hmm. um, but we got, but we saved the colonies and they're good now. Uh, this, uh, this is one of my uh, colleagues, Bill Lewis, evacuating from the Tahunga area. Um, and so, and this is a result of our losses in Ventura. So it's uh, very frustrating um, because these wildfires get worse every year. Um, I hear that Kyle is a ham radio enthusiast and I was you know, listening to uh, the radio, going to bed, you know, monitoring for uh, fire departments and, and police scanners and everything else, worried about the bees. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about honey. So I said that this, so a little thing, you know, uh, all, Scotch is whiskey, but not all whiskey is scotch, right? So all uh, supers are high bodies, but not all high bodies are supers. A super is the, is the box that's going to have honey for the beekeeper. Contrary to what people think, we do not steal honey from the hives. Because the old system, if they're inside of a tree or they're inside of any kind of cavity, like this old school skep hive, there is a limited amount of volume you can put in this hive. There's a limited amount of volume that can be in a tree, in a log, anywhere else. However, Langstroth also discovered that if you give them more volume during the nectar flow, they are like, oh, more space, we'll fill it up. So this makes them produce more honey than they could ever use. And so this box is called a super. This super is going to hold about 40 pounds of honey. 40 pounds of honey, raw local honey, is about uh, 10 to $15 a pound. So this super is worth more than $400, okay? A single super. Now, during the nectar flow on the third or fourth years, this box, this hive, will have three to four of these. So it is, unlike most hobbies, where you're just burning money in a big pile, uh, this hobby can actually pay for itself and actually provide um, people with a little bit of income because that honey will sell. And unlike a lot of other products, you're covered under the, the cottage law and you're actually able to sell honey because honey is naturally antimicrobial. Honey doesn't go bad. They found 4,000 year old honey in Egyptian tombs that was still good to eat. And so it is a very, very healthy food and very profitable. So you guys know this answer already. Uh, this is me, uh, so you can see, you know, what a couple years of beekeeping does. I had to grow a beard and, you know, it's, 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 it's just kind of happened. You got a bee helping me turn on the extractor. Um, and uh, then that, that bee is taking it all back. So. Um, and this is uh, what happens is that the frame gets drawn out and you've got that wax cappings. Okay, now those wax cappings are gonna be repurposed for candles, for lip balm, for lotion, right? And then, and then we have the uh, honey that is now exposed. We're able to put that into an extractor, a centrifuge that spins out that honey, that comes down to the spigot, pour it, you've got raw local honey. Uh, meanwhile, the cappings aren't going to waste. We've got this beeswax that now can be given right back to the bees, and because they don't have to rebuild it, they can get right back to not wasting any energy and filling it up with honey again. So that is, this was, this right now is the most sustainable way of keeping bees, but it's still 1850 technology. Um, so we really do need an upgrade. Uh, now we've got pollen. So pollen is the equivalent of a steak dinner. This is what they're gonna be feeding the larva. 
Okay, now you know the yellow jackets that ruin your picnic and they steal your turkey sandwich? Okay, they're after that protein to feed their grubs. This is what the bee wants to feed the larva back in the hive. Um, this has 30% more protein than beef, um, and uh, it's extremely healthy. And you've got propolis. Anybody play violin here? Any violin players? Yeah, we got one. So that special rosin that they use for the bow and to protect the violin is made with propolis. It's really antimicrobial. Used for centuries as medicine. And uh, of course, it was the, uh, the, the, the Russians uh, in particular um, would distill propolis and vodka, what else? Um, and let it sit up until uh, for about three to four months, use it during flu season. UC Davis began experimenting and found that it did combat everything in the petri dish from bacteria to HIV. So it's uh, pretty potent stuff and they're trying to develop a whole new line of drugs using propolis. Uh, so candle making, so we talked about the beeswax. Nothing, in the, nothing produced by the hive is wasted. So now you've got the candles that are the longest burning candles you could possibly make or buy. Um, this is once again very um, profitable and it's something else that the hive can contribute. And like I mentioned before, we got lotion, lip balm, you can make furniture polish, shaving cream, and you know how I get this beard as wonderful as it is? Some beeswax beard balm, amazing stuff. Um, you got hive removal. So usually, you know, my students are wanting to do this right away, and I try to say, look, you gotta get a couple of years under your belt before you start doing this, because you're working bees when you're above them that is really nice and controllable. When you're working bees from inside of a wall or above you, that is when things can get dicey and dicey quickly. But uh, you get some, uh, some experience and you can start doing hive removals and we get easily $250 an hour for this type of work. It's hard work, devastatingly difficult work, but it's profitable work. Um, and so it's, it's good. Uh, we sell bees uh, packages and nukes, and so we get a pack. We get packages of bees, and we have nucleus colonies, which are five frames of bees. And this is what urban beekeepers would use to start their colonies. Um, in Los Angeles, we have an Africanized bee problem. A really uh, <laughs> a well-intentioned program by a scientist named Warwick Care in Brazil, back in the 1950s. Was trying, he was trying to develop a better bee. The European bee didn't do well in Brazil. And so he was trying to integrate Brazil, uh, European genetics with African genetics. And the result was, hey, he's got a really good bee that is more uh, uh, disease resistant, pest resistant. They find honey everywhere. The European bees don't. They just, they just rip off your face. Um, that's a problem, so they were trying to work on trying to breed the defensiveness out of it, and they escaped the lab. Uh, and they spread throughout Latin America, and back in the 70s and 80s, they were, they were coming up to the states, especially the southwest, and they were called killer the killer bees. Horrible name. Thank you, media. Mm -hmm. um, but here in L.A., they're, they do have a foothold. So what we tell our students that you need to use known genetics. You need to use known genetics. You need to know for sure that you have a nice Italian colony. Oh, by the way, um, honeybees are not native here to the United States. We brought them here in the 1600s. And what we do is that we match the type of bee that's closest to our European counterparts. Take a guess what kind of bee we use here. We have a Mediterranean climate, and so we use a Italian bee. It's great. I open up the hive, we make a cappuccino, it's wonderful. Um, yeah, so this is our packages. Now we're going to talk a little bit about environmental. Now it kind of goes without saying that bees in the environment, man, they are the bellwethers. They are really what lets us know what's going on. As a matter of fact, if it's not happening out there, it's not happening in here. You can almost say that this is a, a monitor, a sensor for what's going on in the environment. But uh, if the bees go, we're going to have a hell of a time here. So they're really important to uh, protect. So uh, something else I'm going to leave you with, something else to, for you to think about as you maybe possibly think about using your, 
your vast intelligence at, at computing to solve this. The major contributors of colony collapse are the four P's. We got pests, pathogens, lack of proper nutrition, and pesticide and fungicides. The four P's. This is what's wiping out 40% of our highs. Monoculture. If I fed you nothing but steak all this month, and then next month I fed you nothing but Coca-Cola, and then the next month I fed you nothing but corn, and then suddenly you got COVID-19, you probably wouldn't be able to do too well, okay? As opposed to having a nice varied diet the entire time. And that is something that our modern way, our, the way that we you do agriculture, everything needs to change from the way that we consumers want the perfect apple to the way that there, uh, we have fields and fields of nothing but one crop. It's really hard on the bees, and that really needs to start changing. Um, pests, so make a fist, put it on your body. That is the relation of what the bromelite is to the bee. That came, came from the Asian honeybee, and the European honeybee has no defense. So this is responsible for about 90% of our collapse um, uh, from direct and indirectly. So this blood, this fat sucker actually, it, it actually eats the lipids. Uh, she will actually inject some 27 different viruses at last count lower the mortality, uh, high, heighten the mortality of the bees, and um, a major, major problem. We got the hive beetle. Uh, you know, I, I have to admit, the, um, the, the beekeepers as a whole kind of slant to the right a little bit, as most farmers do politically. But when I go to these conventions and people are talking about climate change, climate change, climate change, you know, nobody says a word. Not a single beekeeper says a word. We see it every single day. This high beetle list is supposed to be west of the Mississippi. They didn't get the memo. It's now humid enough to where they're getting a foothold here. So that's a problem. Um, we got pesticides. So we got pesticides that people used to have to take a really long test for to get a license to use in the field. The neonicotinoids, you can now get at Home Depot. That's a problem. And most people, unlike the agricultural areas, they, they have to specify exactly how much they're applying and how they're doing it. They're doing it by plant, they're doing it by truck, they're doing it by... However, in an urban environment, homeowners are just grabbing and going and they're spraying, right? More is better, right? That's a problem. This is what a pesticide kill looks like. No disease kills bees like this. Two inches of dead bees on the ground, hundreds of thousands of dead bees from two hives. Um, I hate this, and I'm uh, seeing more of it. Uh, so I would, it's, it's really frustrating, and it doesn't take much. You know, if you've got a problem on something that's growing, if it's blooming, avoid the flowers. Or if you must apply it, wait till dusk when the bees aren't flying. Next morning, the efficacy of that pesticide will drop, and it won't be nearly as hazardous to the bee. So there are little things we can do in Los Angeles, where people would, you, you know, there's a lot of really nice homes, but there's a detachment as to what's being applied in the backyard, and that's a problem. You know, I got a couple of dead bees there. And so, research and awareness. Um, so, the good news is that the word is out, and there's a lot of love toward beekeepers, toward pollinators, toward honeybees, and that is really great, that's really amazing, and we need to capitalize on it because we need young people, we need smart people to start thinking about solutions to this. Um, we really do. And not enough, we don't have enough technology that's going into this field. Um, we've got uh, a, a lot of uh, land options here. We got a lot of or, uh, agencies that we have to deal with in order to get bee land. Um, we're now working with CSUN on the, on the, in the sustainability department to create these pollinator pockets, uh, parts of land that are um, not being used for anything and setting up a garden, setting up a play, an apiary for bees to um, work and it's actually beginning to take off. We're really excited about that. Um, and so 
Uh, we have an ordinance in Los Angeles. Um, I'm not going to get into too much of legalese of that, but uh, you, you need to register the hives. Uh, we have all the basics. So when it comes to the tools, you guys can leave here. You know that we beekeepers are not very creative. Uh, so anybody guess what this is? It's a smoker. So you guys are beekeepers, and you you actually knew that. Well, what do you think this is called? A brush. <laughs> you never get bees in your life when you got two out of three tools. What do you think this is? Yeah, you guys are educated. No, 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 no. We call this a hive tool. Okay. So we, we beekeepers are not really creative in, in, in the name department. Uh, and so these are the main tools of the trade. We use this to smoke the hive, obviously, and to mask that pheromone. So that way, when we open up the hive, bees are looking for that alarm pheromone, but it's not coming. And oh, I guess he's all right. I can work with bees with very little consequence. Brush. I just if I need the bees to be brushed off somewhere where I don't need them, I can do so without hurting them. And the bees propolize everything, and so that propolis seals everything down. So we use the hive tool to break it all apart. And those are the three tools that we use inside of the hive. And so bees need help. And I think the beekeepers in Italy have it right. Because when you ask an Italian beekeeper how many colonies they have, they look at you with a blank face. And they say, no, 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 I, I have 500 families. I have 500 families, they call them families. I think that's appropriate. Thank you very much for letting me be part of your family. Thank you. If anybody has any questions? Yes, sir. So it seems like pesticide is the most problematic issue towards the death of bees. I would, I would say the varroa mite is actually the, the worst. The uh, I, I would say the I would say the varroa mite is the worst second, barely second to that is pesticide. The reason why it's difficult is that everything is interconnected. And so let's say that I have two hives, one that's infected with varroa mite, the other is not. And they both get exposed to the same pesticide. The one that doesn't have varroa mite may recover. They may have enough to recover, but the one with varroa mite they will be nutritionally compromised, they'll have viruses, and so they'll just collapse. They won't be able to, to endure the pressure. Um, likewise, if a hive gets exposed with pesticide and then the varroa mite comes on later or at the same time, they too it won't be compromised and they'll collapse. Or, okay, so now they get exposed a little bit of pesticide, oh, but then the nutri there's a drought, so the, the wildfire burns all around, so now there's no nutrition. Now they're and now they get a varroa mite infestation. Now they have no more fat stores. They will starve to death very quickly. You see how everything is inherently interconnected. Now I neglected to put on here, but there is lately a few cloud uh, programs like Hive Tracks, um, which is trying to help be give beekeepers a tool to be able to record stuff in their colony. Um, there is uh, Beware, which is the California, it's cloud-based, the California system of registering the hives. So all the parties from city inspectors to pesticide applicators can look at it, can go into this program and say, oh, there is a hive within three miles here. I should notify them. So that's a game changer. Uh, but what would be really cool, <laughs> I'd really like, is to be able to be at home and uh, go on my phone and say, oh, wow, my bee yard in Chatsworth, the hives are gaining more than 10 pounds in a week. There's a nectar flow. Oh, look at this yard in Simi Valley. They're losing weight. Wonder why that is. Oh, this, this, this yard in Topanga, the heat clusters inside of the hive. It doesn't matter if it's 10, degro, 10 degrees below zero or 110 degrees, they're gonna keep their brood at 94 degrees Fahrenheit. And if suddenly that heat cluster starts going down, that's indicative of bees dying. That's indicative of disease. And if I could have that on my phone, I would be able to save so much time, so much labor. I'd be able to get alerts. That'd be really nice. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. So, yeah. 
Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, what about uh, high electromagnetic waves uh, killing bees? Is, is there such a thing? I know a lot of people um, fear cell towers and 5G moving. In. And, and so the very beginning of the colony collapse scare, they actually did uh, investigate that, and they found absolutely no causation between magnetic waves and death beats. And so that was disproved. Sure. Yes? So is there, is there, it seems from the slides that you presented that there's a, like no sort of automation in terms of, um, you know, the process of, so there's uh, so there are big extracting lines. Like there's a lot of automation on the back end of beekeeping. Okay. When you pull a hundred supers and then you load them on with forklifts and then you go into a big warehouse and then you put them on these these contraptions that actually throw the frames out of the box and put them down a line. That's all there. Okay. But but what I but what isn't there is a really co a good cost effective way for me to know what's going inside this box without me having to open it. And so usually we inspect a hive every seven to 10 days because it takes them 21 days, a, a, a queen lays an egg, takes 21 days for a worker bee to emerge. It takes 24 days for a drone to emerge. It only takes 16 days for a new queen to emerge. And so if something happens to that queen, Right? I can have a problem in two weeks if I don't get in there. And so something can happen the moment that I walk out of that bee yard. I mean, there's people that have come back and found that, oh, my, I just lost 30 hives to a bear, completely reduced to splinters, and I had no idea. And it happened right after I left, right? So it would be uh, really amazing to know in real time what's going on in these babies. And that way I can protect the bees as effectively and efficiently as possible. Yes? And uh, what are the factors for you to measure what's going on inside that you mentioned, like temperature, like weight, um, what else? All right, so, um, so one is temperature, um, one is weight, and um, those are, I could do a lot with those. I'd be happy with us. I'll take those two. I can I, I can really go crazy with well, something that could measure that did like the, the, some kind of olfactory sensors that are able to measure the pheromones and the open brood pheromone. And I, I, you know what? No temperature and weight that'll go a long way. Yes. How often does the beekeeper extract so there's two words that you will learn to hate with everything to do with the topic of beekeeping, and that is, it depends. Um, and so if uh, that funny thing that we talked about before that comes out of the sky, rain, if that comes down, right, then we, they will, and this is drawn out, uh, we have hives that will fill up 40 pounds of honey in a week. And so between April and, and June, it'll be uh, between uh, 400, to 700 pounds of honey per hive. And then the following, following year, at the same time, maybe 40. And so there is a lot of discrepancy according to what the environment is doing. So you might want to measure how much is in there on a weekly or monthly basis. Do you be checking it often or not as often based on how much is in there? Ah, uh, no, sir. So. No matter what, I have to check it because I need to know what the, how the bees are doing in their health. It's not enough for me to open up the box and say, oh, look, there's bees. Like, I can't do that because I, I could have a bunch of bees in there, but maybe mom just died because she, goes, because she got old and they're queenless. And I have no idea. I could replace the queen and they'd be great, but because I didn't get in there to check, this hive could very well be queenless in a matter of months. So that's, that's a problem. Um, but there, however, um, in case of these really big uh, blooms, like the super bloom we had last year, it would be kind of cool. To, the, the general rule is that after eight frames are filled up with honey, you give them another box. So eight frames out of 10, you give them another box. So if there was some type of way to know that that volume was taken up, that actually could have an application during really good nectar. Yes? 
Whenever you've discovered a uh, hive that's not healthy, have you kept, you guys have any sort, sort of data that correlates the environment with the unhealthy hive? That is a really good question. So, uh, I know what I know what a nutritionally compromised hive looks like. The brood pattern will suddenly get spotty. They'll start cannibalizing the larva because they have no protein coming in, and they and they know they don't have enough resources to, to feed the mouths that are coming out from that brood. You start uh, we, you start learning how to read the frames like a book, where you see the savings account, which is the honey, and then right and then right underneath that is the nectar flow. That is, uh, you will find unripened honey, that nectar, that is the cash flow, and then right below that is the nursery. You've got all those baby bees. And so you begin to recognize that and knowing, okay, great, I'm having great nutrition, or I'm not, or I'm seeing dead bees on the ground with, with their proboscis, with their tongue sticking out, and I know they were exposed by pesticide. Or I'm seeing bees that instead of their, their legs curled in, their legs are actually curled out, that's Israeli paralysis virus, and that's due to bromide. Um, I got bees that are deformed wing, that's bromide. And so, oh, I, I, I open up a frame and I smell, oh my God, that smells horrible. And, 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 the, and, the, and the brood is very stringy. That's American fowl brood. So part of being a beekeeper is learning how to diagnose diseases. Um, and that just comes with experience. Yes? Are there any presumptive uh, cues to know if a disease is coming? Presumptive cues. So that's, that, you know, that is a really, really interesting quandary because a lot of beekeepers for a long time were treating prophylactically. So before there was a foul brood problem, which, which is a bacterial infection, they would treat prophylactically antibiotics. What do you think happened? Got resistance. So nah, nah. now I need to get a prescription from a vet in order to get antibiotics. Luckily, we don't have a foul brood problem here now because the spores can actually live inside of the wood for dozens and dozens of years. You can accidentally reinfect colonies with it. So it's a very insidious disease. The only way that you can disinfect a hive with foul brood is to throw away the frames and then take a blowtorch to the inside of the box. Um, and so what we're trying to do is try to, tr is try to take care of bees before there's a problem. And so what we're doing is that we're monitoring mite loads, for example. We'll do a sugar roll, and we want a 3% infestation in the hive. Anything more than 3% of mites, we have a problem. And so we'll take a, a half a cup of bees, that's 300 bees, we'll put it into a container, put powdered sugar in there, roll them, sprinkle it. They just love this. Um, and then I count how many mites are in that sample. And there's more than three, oh, I should think about treating. I should think about it. Just maybe not, but if it's seven, eight, 10, 12, even if I'm not seeing the disease manifestation, even if I'm not seeing deformed wing, I should really think about knocking down those mites because it's only a matter of time until I do. And so the answer to your question is, it depends. Sometimes there are, and sometimes there isn't. And you're, and you're reacting immediately because you've got a fire to burn out, or you know that a problem's coming, and you, can add, and you can do something about it. So for example, let's, uh, there, there's an old 13th century poem. A swarm in May is worth a horse and some hay. A swarm in June, a silver spoon. A swarm in July ain't worth a fly. Why do you think that is? Because hives that come on that late don't have nearly enough time to make any honey just to survive the winter time. They're gonna starve out. So it's not gonna be worth anything. They're going to die on you. So if you get started in beekeeping late or if something happens, there's not any food and it's July and it's really light, what can you do to get them to survive the winter time? You feed them. To make sure they've got the savings account in there to survive the winter. So there are some things, as you become more of a beekeeper, you recognize, okay, I need, they need food, they need medicine, and you just recognize the signs. But, and so, you, so before you have a collapsing hive. Make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, we have one more. Go ahead. Actually, I have two questions. Go ahead. The first one is how do you know if a queen has died? And the second one is how do you know if a tiger is going to be over your queen? Is it just an LSA thing or is it kind of a 
Okay, so I, he asked me, how do I know that the queen has died? And I get a few cues. Number one, the hive is very noisy because you're going to be desperately trying to spread that queen pheromone and they're fanning their wings. So if I open up a hive and I'm hearing it what's called a queenless roar, I can be like, ugh, I don't even have to drop down to this first box and I can probably have a queen problem. Number two, there will be queen cells. So how does a, how does a hive make a queen? If I were to pluck out a queen from a hive, the queen pheromone would drop. They would know they don't have mom anymore. They would find eggs that are less than three days old, and they're gonna feed that egg, that larva, nothing but boiled jelly. And that extra lipid and protein is going to actually develop into a virgin queen. And now they're gonna hedge their bets. They're gonna make between five to 15 virgin queens. They're going to emerge, they're gonna fight to the death, Whoever wins that fight becomes queen of the hive. So it's like Game of Thrones, but with a much better ending. Um, and so from there, she goes on a mating flight, and then she's off to the races, and she's laying. So what I do, and so a telltale sign is that if I see queen cells in the middle of the frame, that is a queen that was lost. If I see queen cells at the bottom of the frame, that's a hive that wants to swarm. And they're basically the macroorganism wants to reproduce, it wants to split. And I gotta do something to stop that because that's two thirds of my workers leaving. So I have to try to think about how I can appease that. Either I split them or I make them think they swarmed. However, the answer to your question about what about the about the legality of beekeeping, the answer is this. It depends on your city's if, if your city does not have uh, an ordinance, they almost always a fault to the LA County, okay? Some don't. Some, like in um, uh, Burbank, for example, doesn't want her to be keepers. Um, the church, uh, well, the Los Angeles, but, uh, but a lot of, but almost all of the uh, cities around, well, if they don't have an ordinance uh, prohibiting it, they basically follow LA County. And so for, uh, for if you want, I, I really didn't want to get to the ordinance here, but if you're interested, please come by and we'll go into it. And it's, it's really, really simple, really simple stuff. And so um, if you guys are interested, uh, please visit us over at the Valley High in Chatsworth. Um, and uh, we really look forward to working with you guys. And I really expect you guys to be dropping off <coughs> products and solutions and uh, technology next week, if that's what comes to um, Thanks again, everybody. Thank you. All right. Well, that was wonderful. Keith, really, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. That was, that was fantastic. Uh, can we get another round of applause for Keith, please? So I will admit, uh, when I first heard that uh, one of the best recommendations that we had for somebody to speak was somebody who works with an organization that works with bees, uh, I immediately got excited because, as he pointed out, I have a lot of really weird hobbies, um, and I've always wanted to keep bees. Uh, and so, you know, it was just it was just too good, too really brilliant of a solution to address a, a sustainability talk with somebody who's gonna kind of bring a new perspective. So thank you so much for that, Keith, and for all the work that you do at the Valley High, really absolutely fantastic. Um, all right, so what we're gonna do next is we touched on sustainability, we touched a little bit on the competition, and we'll get to the competition towards the end. But right now, uh, I wanna talk about this. I wanna talk about the cloud. Um, and most importantly, what are you? What is the cloud, right? Uh, so uh, this was the first image that came up when I searched Google for the cloud. Uh, and I think that the, the interesting thing about this is that it doesn't tell me anything about the cloud. It just seems to make it sound or, or look at least like the cloud is this magical place where where locks and security and, and knowledge and computers and mail and the world all connect. And while that is true, it also is kind of a, an over-representation of what the cloud really is. So I wanted to kind of find something that would sort of distill 
what the cloud actually is for those who either haven't worked with the cloud before or those who really are kind of diving in for the first time, not super technical. So taking a step back, uh, I actually found a really interesting quote from Abraham Lincoln that fits here. Uh, the cloud refers to computers that are accessed over the internet <laughs> and software and databases that run on those computers. Hang on. Um, oh, I'm wrong. Uh, that was actually Cloudflare, yeah. uh, the web services company. Uh, this is actually a really great description of what Thank you for the face palm over there, sir. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is really what the cloud is, is it's computers that you access over the internet and the software and databases and information that they contain. Um, so if, if we wanted to get a look at kind of how the cloud really is represented, uh, instead of that wonderful picture, we can look. Oh. Um, this looks really complicated. Uh, and in this case, actually, this is. This is designed to be an incredibly resilient architecture. Um, as you can see, you have uh, servers that are auto-scaling. You actually have clusters of computers that are automatically spinning up and spinning down based on need. Uh, you have kind of segmented connections so that information really only lives where it needs to and kind of flows through the services appropriately. Over on the right, you have what looks to be kind of a, a bunch of, of icons and, and, and product names. But in actuality, those are services that you can help use to facilitate a lot of this, this interchange in the cloud. So this is a kind of an extreme example of what can happen if you start to really, really, really leverage cloud technologies. But this application in particular, while I don't necessarily know exactly what this application was for, full disclosure, I took it from a reInvent presentation, which is Amazon's annual uh, cloud service conference. Uh, but I guarantee you, if you took one of those components out or took away one of the availability zones and kind of took out what normally we would consider to be a critical part of the architecture, this application would probably still stay up. You could hit this application with 10 requests. You could hit this application with 10,000 requests in a second. And it would probably still be delivering results at about the same speed. So taking it back to kind of its more simple forms, right? let's take a step back. Let's get away from the complexity. And let's focus on some of the things that you use every day or that you could use every day uh, that are cloud applications. A big one is email. Uh, this is something that I would be willing to wager every single one of you has experience with. Email is a kind of cloud computing, primarily because you're interacting with the server, which is where your emails are stored. When I send an email, it doesn't go to directly to your phone or directly to your computer. It goes to the service that you have your email through. So in this case, it would be Google. I send via my own set of servers. Uh, I send an email to Google. Google holds onto that for you, and you access it over the internet. You can download it to your device. You can look at it through the browser. But in the end, that information and all the processing around it is coming from those Google servers. Right? If we look at something like Instagram, social media in general, this is all cloud computing because, again, you're storing that information with that service. That information isn't just solely on your phone. And that's actually kind of the whole point of social networks, which actually makes social networks kind of one of those, those really unique, almost exclusively cloud applications. Anything that has to do with sharing or communicating information, uh, or especially demonstrating that information to a wider audience outside of people who would just be in your immediate circle, are perfect candidates. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> are perfect candidates uh, for, for kind of evaluation uh, and their cloud efficacy. Uh, another one, and actually something that CSUN itself offers, is the My CSUN software platform. This is a really cool example of something where you're not necessarily interacting with the results of the software on the application, but the actual software itself. So astute viewers might see in that top left, I have an Apple logo. And yet in the window here, uh, my close, minus, and full screen are over there on the right hand side. Well, that's because this particular application, Visio, does not run on a Mac. This is my computer communicating with a server 
in this case here in uh, CSUN's data center that runs Windows, that is running this program and communicating all of that information onto my computer. So in this case, my computer isn't processing any of this. This is all being processed in the cloud. So this is a form of cloud computing because again, the software, the processing, the information is not necessarily on your computer, but happening on another computer. So I had a little analogy, and this has had audio, but uh, it wasn't worth getting it up and running for this. So let's say I'm at my house. Uh, my house is blue, not green, but let's just pretend here for a second. So this is my house, and this is my computer inside my house. Right? This would not be an example of cloud computing because I am using my computer inside my house. Now, if we take a look at something called a data center, this is where a large majority of servers are housed, and this is where if you're going to be communicating with some stuff in the cloud, nine times out of, out of ten, it's going to be within a data center. There's going to be a bunch of servers, a bunch of computers running that are actually able to run those applications that you interact with. So. Can anybody tell me how I could turn, or how I could kind of take my computer and turn it into a more cloud service uh, structure? VSphere? VSphere? Yeah, absolutely. If, if we had something like VirtualBox running, absolutely, definitely. Um, the simplest version would be for me to just move that computer over to the data center and then interact with it remotely. Even if I were to do that, and that's kind of how my CSUN software is operating in a sense. Um, but in just doing that, we have turned that computer into a cloud computer. Because again, it's not on site. I'm interacting with the data and the software over the internet. Uh, but typically, computers and data centers don't tend to look like this. They tend to look a little bit more like this. This is kind of your typical server, uh, because for these applications, you don't need a monitor. You don't need a keyboard. People are interacting with these computers remotely. So taking a look back at that definition, the cloud refers to computers that are accessed over the internet and accessing the software and databases that are on those computers. So that, that definition fits really well with the example of moving a computer into the cloud, of uh, moving a computer into a data center. Uh, but it could also be taking at resources within a data center and just simply leveraging those so this could be something like, you know, if you wanted to use vSphere, that's uh, definitely going to be an application that you can install on those servers. Uh, but even just spinning those servers up in the cloud, in the resources that you can get um, through some of those, the, the cloud vendors or that's already at a data center, will get you 90% of the way towards having a cloud application. But, you know, following kind of Keith's example, kind of a, a real interesting and kind of thought-provoking take on, on what sustainability looks like and how that, how that looks here locally. Um, I kind of wanted to go the complete opposite direction and go with what I think is probably the coolest, uh, coolest example of cloud computing. Uh, for anybody who's ever been in my office, I have actually an entire corner of my office where I have nothing but space stuff. Um, and so the first thing that came to my mind was the Curiosity Rover. Because this is a wonderful example of kind of taking cloud computing really to the extreme. If you look at the way that we have to communicate with the Curiosity Rovers or the other rovers that are on Mars, we have to, for all intents and purposes, send communications to satellites that are orbiting Earth. Then those communications need to be relayed to satellites that are orbiting Mars. And then that information can be sent down to the rover. And the rover has to understand what to do with that information, how to take that information, how to operate, what to do, and what information we're requesting back. And that's exactly what cloud computing is. I'm sending a request to another device via some kind of network. In this case, it's, <laughs> it's a stellar network uh, rather than a, a local internet network. Uh, but we're telling it what we're looking for and what we're expecting out of that service. And those are really the kinds of things that we want to look for. So for, for uh, Keith's example, right, he mentioned that he wanted something where he could see these boxes 
and see their, their contents, their weight, their temperature, right? Well, that's something pretty similar to what they're doing with the Curiosity rover. They're setting up instrumentation. In this case, it's the actual rover itself and the kind of scientific instruments that it has on it. But in this case, that could be as simple as having a small hole in here where we inject a the thermometer, right? And then having a little computer attached to the side that has some kind of network connection that can relay that temperature back. Uh, a simple weight sensor or a scale underneath could also do uh, monitoring of the actual weight of the box, right? We're setting up for what, we, what kind of information we want to get out of it. And then when Keith were to open his phone, see you know, what's going on with this particular item, in this case, these boxes, you would be able to see the current weight, the current temperature, because his phone has sent the request out to this computer or this device, which may or may not be relaying that information to other servers. Uh, Keith mentioned a little bit earlier that, uh, that in some cases, some of these boxes are kind of out in the middle of nowhere where there's not necessarily any communication. So there may be some additional infrastructure that would be needed if you wanted to have that communication happen on the mobile phone, but it definitely could be done. But the important thing is that you need to set the application up or you need to set the cloud service up to be able to understand and process the requests that you're giving it. So I made this cloud checklist to answer the question of, is this a cloud application? And I promise you, it's incredibly simple. Number one, do you access it via the internet or network? I did have to put that in there because I explicitly said that the Mars Curiosity rover uh, was a cloud computing technology. So I've covered my bases here a little bit. And then is the information stored on the computer at the other end, or does the computer process and return information? So what that means is the computer on the other side, does it actually store information that I'm accessing, that I'm requesting from it? Or do I send information to it, have that computer process it, and then return back a different answer, a manipulated answer, right? So if those two things are met, that's all you need. This is it. This, this is determining whether your application or whether your project or idea would be a cloud application. Does it talk to the internet? And does it store something? Or does it compute or process information in some way and give a different result? So how do you get started with working with the cloud? Um, well, you can take a look at some of the cloud vendors. Uh, so again, we have uh, IBM here. John is here. Thank you so much, John, for coming. Uh, we also have AWS, who again is joining us remotely and who will be around after the presentation if you want to ask questions. Uh, again, travel restrictions out of an abundance of caution. They're still stuck in Seattle, but Raj and, and Brooke, thank you so much for joining us remotely. Really appreciate that. Uh, but you also have Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, and their Firebase product. Uh, Firebase in particular, I did want to give a special shout out to because that is kind of specifically designed for real quick uh, implementations of some really, really quick uh, cloud infrastructure wins. So if you wanted to have cloud storage or you wanted to have a cloud database, you can get those really, really, really easily set up with Firebase. Uh, not that the other ones can't do it, but if you're looking for something quick to get up and started and you're looking at Google, Firebase is actually a really great option rather than going all the way into Google Cloud and spinning up your services directly. It's much more focused at kind of how are you actually going to use it. And then my suggestion would be start with a server or a service and just kind of go from there. Uh, figure out what it is that, that you would want to do. Uh, figure out what it is that you would want to be, what information you would want to be getting, what kind of information you would want to be sending. And if you're comfortable setting up servers, or if you're comfortable with the services that are being offered, just go ahead and start with that and figure <laughs> out, okay, now how do I get information into that system? Okay, now how do I get that information out of that system? Okay, now how do I process that? Take a kind of step-by-step -step approach, but definitely just start with spinning something up. If you're comfortable with terminal, that's great. You can spin up something like an AWS EC2 instance. Um, you can spin up a Google Cloud virtual machine. You can spin up an IBM virtual machine. Fantastic, have fun. Uh, if you're not as comfortable with that, there are lots of other options for ways that you can get started without necessarily having to know, again, how to use terminal or how to connect to those particular kinds of computers. So again, we come back to this. Every single one of these things are processes or applications that are running 
on AWS's infrastructure. So these are, we would communicate with every single one of these via the internet. Um, again, this particular application would be pretty robust. There are actually tools out there that are designed to test how, not necessarily how complicated this is, but how resilient this is. Uh, Netflix uses AWS for all of their hosting. It's actually kind of amazing. Uh, a large majority of the internet's traffic comes from Netflix and from YouTube. Those are two of the biggest traffic users in the United States. And they all have architectures where they have tools. Uh, in Netflix's case, it's called Chaos Monkey, which is designed to actively disable parts of your infrastructure and see if your application is still working as expected. So the resiliency of these kinds of projects and the functionality that they offer and the, the speed with which they can offer it is starting to get really astounding these days. For this particular competition, you do not need to go this far. If you talk to the judges and you have one of these architecture diagrams, that's fantastic. You've absolutely done your homework. Um, again, it, without necessarily properly understanding every single piece of this though, it would be really tough to explain to somebody exactly what's going on here. Right? So thinking about that, I thought, what's a really good example of something that I can show that's using those cloud technologies in a way that might actually be a little bit useful? So over the weekend, uh, I put together a little project uh, in conjunction with some of the members of the CSUN AI Club that can basically pass any image I want through an image recognition service. Uh, in this case, I picked three, uh, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, and AWS. The only reason I picked those three is because those are the three largest cloud vendors out there right now. Um, and she doesn't know this, but I fed in a picture of my wife with an iguana on her head um, and just drew the rectangles of every single thing that these image recognition systems found in there. Um, this is not necessarily a great representation of exactly how these, these services work um, because I was looking for very specific things, but I wanted to point out some of the differences between these cloud vendors. Again, this image itself is not necessarily indicative. It does not imply anything about the quality of the service or anything about how the service works on the back end, but it is just a demonstrator to show you that there can be some differences in the kinds of things that those services are looking for or the kinds of things that they're finding or the way that they train their system. So uh, this one on the left is AWS. And as you can see, the red boxes are only around the two people in the background. It did not pick up the fact that there's a person in the front and it did not pick up the iguana. Um, spoiler alert, nobody found the iguana. And I was really disappointed about that. Uh, in the, the one in the middle, which is Google, it picked up the top, it picked up the person, it picked up her backpack. It said it was a luggage or a bag. Uh, but it did think that the iguana was a hat. <laughs> um, now the iguana, if you look very carefully, the iguana is wearing a hat. Uh, her, name is, her name is Juanita, and she was wearing a hat. So, I mean, kudos, kudos to you, Google. Um, but Juanita herself is not necessarily a hat. She's an iguana. Um, and then over on the right-hand side, we have Microsoft, which really picked up uh, two things. The fact that uh, my wife is a person, and the fact that she is under an umbrella. <laughs> Once again, nobody got the iguana. I was really kind of disappointed about that. I kind of thought it was a gotcha, but, or, or a gimme, but you know, it's on top of her head. I'll, 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 give, I'll give them credit for that. You don't necessarily tend to find iguanas on top of people's heads. But again, I, I bring this up to point out, there are differences between these services. They're all looking for something a little bit different. They've all used some different data to train their models in order to get that information out. In this case, this is an artificial intelligence application that I'm using to recognize this stuff. But not all cloud services are artificial intelligence. In this case, it was just a really good one to demonstrate the stuff that I was looking for. And again, this doesn't necessarily mean that AWS couldn't have picked up that this is a picture of a person. Um, in fact, I actually ran it through in the interface and it did pick up on that. Um, and what interface do I mean? This is AWS recognition. This is the same exact service that I used to run uh, the analysis 
of my wife with one yet. And so in this case, I fed in a picture of the OBI library. And as you can see on the right-hand side, on the results, I got there are plants, there's grass, it's a building, there's a lawn. It picked up the fact that there's a person, which is this little blue thing on the stairs right there. That's the person walking up that it was actually able to detect. Uh, AWS seems to be really good at detecting very small people in the background, so good on that. Um, but as you can see, this was done via a simple upload form. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to download any code. I didn't have to write any code in order to get this information. Um, and this is kind of one of the beautiful things that the cloud can allow you to do. It can allow you to get access to services and information in such a way that you don't always necessarily need to be super comfortable with programming. You don't need to be super comfortable with things like virtualization software, like VirtualBox or vSphere. Um, if you want to, and you want to go into it, absolutely, by all means, that's fantastic. But you don't have to, and that's kind of the beautiful thing about it. Uh, all of the functionality, all of the performance gains, all of the kind of societal improvements that you can get from the cloud, in a lot of cases, you can get just by logging in, which is really cool. So let's take a step back and, and kind of put all this together, and kind of take an analysis of the cloud itself. The cloud is just computers and their software accessed over the internet. Cloud computing can be complex, or as we saw with the recognition interface, it can be pretty simple. Um, and cloud tech powers anything from social networking apps to uh, other mobile apps, for instance, the one that Keith would be looking for, um, and beekeeping purposes, of course. Uh, if, if, if anybody wants to do a beekeeping uh, project for Cloud Jam, that would actually be pretty cool. Uh, and I'm sure Keith would definitely appreciate it. And everybody at the Valley Hive. Uh, also, you can use it for recognizing images of your spouse with an iguana. But, um, that may just be me at this point. <laughs> um, so that's it for the cloud. Um, does anybody have any questions about kind of the cloud or cloud technologies or anything that was in that last bit? And then we'll go into the presentation about the, the contest. Anybody? Yeah. Is that actually your personal pet you want? No, her name is Juanita. No, so I mean, well, where, where does Juanita fit into the into the family. Juanita lives in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's not in my family. She was momentarily. Um, but uh, no, she, she's... Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How... Um, so you didn't choose Watson because it just wasn't as popular as GCP, AWS, and Azure? Was, was that the only reason they use as a demo? For that particular demonstration, yeah, I was focusing on, on the main three. Okay. Um, those were the, the top three that I, I just wanted to, to get done first. And again, that was a weekend project. So uh, IBM, I had actually started to download the SDK, but I ran out of time. Um, so that was actually the next, the next set. And so you did bring up something really interesting. And so you said Watson in particular, which is the name of a lot of IBM's AI services but they also have a lot of other services in the cloud as well. So for instance, IBM Q is not necessarily Watson, that's actually their quantum computing product. Um, so Watson is always IBM, but not all IBM is Watson. Right, right, okay. So, yeah. Although Watson is the name of the computer that they put on Jeopardy, so that's definitely the most popular name one. All right, okay, so Real quick, before we hop into the presentation, um, because it's always nice to kind of point this out, uh, this is a picture of my team and I at the first jam competition, and one of the other members is actually in this room, but I'm not gonna call him out because I don't want him to feel nervous. Um, but we actually, we competed in the, present, in the competition at first. We competed in the first app jam. Um, we got second place. There's actually a picture of the banner that we still have. Uh, it's not there anymore. It's actually in a different location now, but we still do have that banner. Um, you know, again, coming back to why we're doing what we're doing, right? The, um, the meaningful, the fun, uh, the impactful, right? Those are all things that, that we took out of this, that we still have with us to this day. So it's really important to us that we make sure that that connection can happen with every single person who decides to participate in Cloud Jam. So coming into what it is that we're looking for in this competition, what really is it all about? 
Well, the deliverables that we're looking for, there will be four milestones that will be in Canvas. And those milestones are varying, uh, varying complexities of deliverables effectively. They can be a sentence, they can be a short paragraph, but basically they're just gonna be asking you a question of kind of where you're at in the project. Uh, the final deliverable will be a video uh, at the end of, the, uh, at the, end of the, the competition that will actually take you into the showcase. That will be judged. But the first three, um, or the first one that's due March 9th, uh, will be just the name of your team members, uh, team name if you want to give one, if not, that's fine. Team names are usually encouraged uh, and tend to be pretty fun. Um, and a basic overview of some of the ideas that you're thinking about or kind of what you're, what you're discussing. Um, the video deliverable at the end will be submitted to Canvas. It will be a two to three minute video. Um, there will also be an opportunity to upload it to Portfolio so that it can actually be a part of your portfolio and a part of your CSUN persona. Um, but uh, that two to three minute video is effectively going to be your elevator pitch. What did you do? How did you do it? How does it apply to sustainability in Los Angeles? The judging criteria, I figure we go ahead and just throw this in real quick. Uh, these are the four questions that the judges are going to be asked. And these are the four questions that the judges are going to be thinking about as they're watching your video and as they're talking to you at the showcase. Um, these are the exact questions that we're going to have in there. So there is no trickery here. These are the questions that they're going to be asked to rate you on a scale of one to five. All of this information will be available on Canvas as well, so you can reference it later if you like. Um, but wanted to make sure that we, we gave you as much as we could here. The showcase itself will be on April 6th, 2 to 4 p.m., same bad time, same bad channel, right here in this room. Uh, during that time, the winners will be announced. We're gonna have two winners. We're gonna have a grand prize winner and a runner up. Um, everybody will be winners in my book, um, but unfortunately in a competition, you have to have winners. Um, so those are the two. Uh, the best thing to do and some of the most impactful things that we've seen at the showcase uh, is to have a two minute pitch for the judges, something where you can kind of quickly and easily give a quick elevator pitch uh, kind of demonstrate your product in such a way that you can show off the things that you've done in the past month. Um, and demos are incredibly impactful. You don't necessarily need to have a fully functioning application, but if you have something where you can click something or touch something or tap something and something else happens, even if it's not perfectly wired up, um, those are definitely things that, that help contribute to the judges answering those questions more effectively, a little bit more in your favor. Uh, so before we get to the prizes, I wanted to give a few kind of special shout outs. Um, so the CSUN Institute for Sustainability has uh, donated some money, some prize money uh, that, we're, that we're gonna be giving to the winners. So uh, we definitely wanna thank them for their participation. CSUN Information Technology also donated some money to the pot. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll put a little blurb of, of kind of how they define themselves and their, um, their website on the slides here. And again, all these slides will be up in, in Canvas for you to reference a little bit later. Uh, the CSUN i uh, is a uh, customer discovery um, program on Canvas. Uh, so they have pitched in first one of the prizes uh, and Toolbox LA. This is our uh, only external uh, partner other than of course the Valley Hive. Um, but prize wise, uh, Toolbox LA is effectively kind of like a maker space, event space, co-working space um, that they, they have a lot of really, really, really cool resources, um, including a connection with venture capitalists. And so they've also uh, given a little bit. So I definitely wanted to make sure that everybody kind of got their shout outs. Um, before we go into what the prizes look like. So the grand prize winner, the grand prize t winning team will get up to $1,000. Um, and we put up to up there because the way these prizes will be distributed is traditionally via scholarships. So if there are any concerns about financial aid or anything like that, please just go ahead and reach out to us. We're happy to work with you to get all those questions answered. But the long and short of it is we have up to $1,000 to be able to get out to the winning team. Uh, Toolbox LA has also donated a three month pass to Toolbox, uh, along with a one hour consultation 
with some of the managers there to discuss kind of some of the feasibility of, the, of your product and your project and to kind of see what would kind of be the next steps for you from there. And then CSUN i has also been willing to, to give entry into the i program. The runner up prizes, we have up to $500. Again, same stipulation with the scholarships. Happy to answer any of those questions. A two week pass to Toolbox LA. Uh, no consultation there, but at least the being in that area and kind of working with the people there, you're going to kind of inherently network if you decide to go. Um, and again, entry into CSUN i -Corps. As far as support, uh, we're gonna have discussion boards inside the Canvas course. Uh, resources are gonna be available, again, within the Canvas course. We've requested from the vendors that are, that are helping us out, just a list of some of the resources or some of the places that we, can, uh, that, that we can send you to that have helpful videos, helpful information on how to get started and kind of some, some additional support that way. Um, we're also getting some, we're working with LinkedIn Learning to get some, some video series for you. Uh, one of the ones that was brought up that I thought was really interesting that we're, we're gonna try to get posted for you is how to create an elevator pitch um, because that is incredibly useful going into the competition. Again, that two minute elevator pitch and some kind of a working demo is fantastic. It's incredibly impactful. Um, the Creative Media Studio, right upstairs, first floor of the library. Uh, they have software, camera rentals, 3D printers, Arduino kits, maker kits. They, they have a ton of really cool stuff that if you don't feel comfortable either getting into the cloud, uh, the cloud services on your own, or if you, don't, if you wanna make your video and you don't necessarily have a camera, um, they have a ton of stuff that you can rent. Uh, just make sure that you kind of reserve it a little bit earlier just so that they, they can make sure that they have availability. Uh, and then in terms of non-coding resources, because again, we want to make sure that uh, you only have a month. We don't need to be convinced that you can create a login system in a month. We don't need to be convinced that you can create user management services in a month. Please do not put your time there. Please put your time much more into the things like the demonstration and into the the kind of refinement of the idea. And to kind of help facilitate that, we wanted to point out a few services. Uh, number one being Zapier, which is effectively a service that lets you connect services to other services and kind of have triggers so that when something happens, something else updates in potentially another service. Um, this is effectively how in some people's houses, so for instance in my house, full disclosure, uh, we have a, a Harmony remote system that we can talk to our Alexa device and turn on our TV and kind of customize a lot of our, uh, a lot of our entertainment center. Those two services normally wouldn't be able to talk to each other unless I went in there and coded and got API keys. I didn't want to have to do that. So Zapier can handle that. Adobe XD is a kind of prototyping tool. Uh, you can use it to wireframe out some sketches. You can even use it to create some Alexa skills uh, to, to mock them up if you like. Uh, and then Microsoft Power Automate is something that just kind of can take information, again, from multiple sources, process it in some really interesting ways. Uh, and it can also be scheduled, so you can have something that, say, would update a database or update a file in Box or update a file in Google Drive uh, every few minutes. And you could use that potentially as a data source in your application or in your project. And so why would you want to compete? Obviously, you clearly came here, so thank you so much for that. Um, but we wanted to make sure that this competition was over spring break so that you had that time available to you if you wanted. Please, if you have plans, do not let this stop you. Um, but we wanted to make sure that that opportunity was available to you where you weren't necessarily thinking about midterms or anything like that. Um, we want you to learn about the technology that you're actually going to use in the workforce. And pretty much every industry is going to be using cloud technology in one way or another. You may not necessarily be directly in the AWS console, you might not be in the Google Cloud console. But again, you use email and you're going to use the results of these technologies. So getting a little bit of understanding on the back end is really, really, really helpful. Um, and will we'll help you when you need to work with those applications, understand what their limitations are and why those limitations are there. Uh, you can win without coding. I put an asterisk there because of course coding is awesome if you can do it, but if not, that's fine. Again, using those other services that we have listed on there, Adobe XD, Zapier, and Microsoft Power Automate, um, you can get a lot of stuff done with that. Uh, and you can make it seem like there's a lot of stuff being done, uh, which is really helpful. Uh, and the experience. 
you know, this is definitely uh, something that, at least for, for myself, has been a, a really wonderful experience. I still look back on, on that time that I spent very fondly. And the stuff that I learned, I actually still use, even though it was a month-long competition. Uh, but also, it, it's fun. You know, the ability to kind of come up, come together uh, in teams of two to five, talk about an idea, discuss how you're going to do it, discuss what connections that has to Los Angeles, to sustainability. Um, it's just, it, honestly, it, it, it's a fun time. Anybody who's participated in a previous jam uh, will be able to tell you that, yes, it's a bit of a crunch, but it's also definitely pretty fun. Uh, and of course, those prizes. Uh, it's always nice. So, uh, again, a couple extra shout outs. Uh, there are some other competitions happening right now that we definitely want to make sure that we also encourage you to, to check out. Uh, Bullring applications are due on Sunday. Uh, they have up to $70,000 in cash and prizes, and we put a link in there for you. Um, you can participate in both, so we're definitely not saying only go over to them if you want to participate in both. But um, there's also Data Jam, which is starting, uh, kicking off September 25th. We got a lot of questions about Data Jam last time around. Um, and so we actually have a starting date right before we go into Cloud Jam, which is fantastic. Uh, and, and both of those websites will tell you more about those competitions. So are there any questions about the competition? Yes. So I know a lot of these call services So that that's a really good question. Um, so we've actually talked with with every single one of the vendors up there um, to say kind of what what can what can we what can we offer. Um, so we actually have resources in the we will have resources in the Canvas course. Um, that basically tell you, you can actually renew some of those. So IBM in particular, I know for sure, John it can tell you about that, but um, you can actually renew that access. Uh, AWS has not only those initial student credits, but they also have their free tier in general. Um, when I pointed out Google and I pointed out Firebase explicitly, a lot of Firebase stuff is free and it already in the free tier, uh, which is one of the nice things. Uh, Azure can sometimes renew, um, we will have more information on that in the Canvas course, though. But yeah, the cost should not necessarily be a concern because for almost every single one of these, uh, CSUN has either partnered with these, these cloud vendors or there are already solutions that are out there that basically makes it you don't have to spend any money. And also those services that I listed there are free as well. Microsoft Power Automate, uh, Zapier, and Adobe XD, those are free. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Well, yeah. Uh, what is the maximum size of the team, and uh, what is the deadline date? I think you mentioned March 9th. We're coming up with the team name. Yes. So the the team information uh, will be due March 9th. That is just who's in your team, what your team name is, and just a brief little bit about about um, what your uh, what kind of ideas you're tossing around. Uh, but the team sizes are two to five individuals. Uh, so two people is fine, five people is fine, six people is a bit too many. Um, but yeah, teams of two to five. Yes? So the prize would be $1,000 to cover everybody in the team, or up to $1,000 and up to $500 to cover the entire team. Um, so I suppose if you want to think about it, it would pre be if there were two people on the team, we would, and then they won the grand prize, we would do, we would do up to five hundred dollars per person. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, great. Well, thank you all for coming, and good luck. And we have all your email addresses, so we will automatically add you to the Canvas course.